coming up on Reframed. And along with us this week is our special guest, Carson Tweller, all the way from the US, which is very exciting. And today, together, we'll be discussing the film A Quiet Place 2. Yeah, okay, I came with my most discerning uh you know like intention to really pick this apart i have to say uh it holds up pretty well the same as me like it's not like we became disabled and we're just like perfect advocates and like inclusive experts from day one that was really nice to sort of show an able-bodied audience that actually you can meet us in the middle like we don't have to always be the ones accommodating to fit into your world you can actually make some accommodations to let us fit into your world welcome back to reframed the podcast that reframes how disability is portrayed in film and tv i'm your host jason and today i have my lovely co-host stephanie dower and along with us this week is our special guest carson tweller all the way from the us which is very exciting And today, together, we'll be discussing the film A Quiet Place 2. But before we do, let's say hello to Carson and learn a bit more about him. So welcome to the podcast, Carson. Did you just want to start off by letting everyone know a bit about you and what you do? Yeah, yeah. So I'm Carson Tuller, like you said, and I'm a personal and professional development coach, a disability advocate, and a professional speaker. I am currently living in Utah in Salt Lake City, just moved from New York, Um, and I'm just excited to be with you today. (laughs) You just said one of my favorite places, New York City, so I'm jealous that you got to live there. Um, (laughs) I've been, you know, doing my background digging on you, of course, Um, (laughs) and one thing, I guess one thing I, I saw that you obviously share a lot of yourself on social media and and have made quite a following out of that. You know, obviously you went through, you have a spinal cord injury, you went through that transition process. How, I guess my question is, how did you, how did sharing your story on social media really influence your your journey with, through that period? I think it's had a massive influence on my journey uh, with spinal cord injury. I kind of inadvertently, amassed a following, I guess I just start. So when I was injured in 2013, I had a friend who started a blog and the idea was that the blog would offload some of the pressure that my family was feeling to keep my loved ones updated, my community, my family, my friends, all of that. I thought I would give somewhat of an update of how things are going in the hospital. So he would update this blog, say this is how Carson's doing through his recovery. Um, and you know, so he was just updating things. So eventually, um, I said, I'd love to write something. And so I kind of took the blog over and started writing things and writing about grief at the time and, uh, loss because I was just experiencing a big transition. Um, and that slowly transformed into me starting to ask more questions about disability and then write about that. And I really kind of journaled my unlearning process and my relearning process about what it means to have a disability because I was an able-bodied person before and I had all sorts of biases and internalized ableism and I just kind of blogged it every bit of the way and then I switched over it was like a blog spot thing and then I switched over to Instagram and started doing uh, blog-esque posts there And that's when it kind of started. So I just kept going. But I mean, if you look back on my posts, you you can see the slow transformation. Like, I'm pretty sure I have a post where I refer to myself as differently abled. (laughs) And I even like make, even make like an argument about why it's more accurate or something, right? In my attempts to kind of like cling to ability, right? Um... And so anyway, it's been very interesting and um, people have been really generous to allow me to grow, not allow me, but stay with me as I've grown and, and learned things. And, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a key part of my journey, I guess. And I think that's like one of the coolest parts about your social media is that you haven't tried to like filter it 
all too much. Like yeah. it just is where you are at that moment in time, if that made any sense at all. Like you've just like, yeah. you just share like real moments of like, today was fucking shit because of X, Y, and Z. Mm. And then, you know, and like you said, like, I don't even know if you've removed that post. If we went and looked for it, it's probably still there where you've said <laughs> differently abled. But you always talk about the fact that you've not like, you know, same as me. Like, it's not like we became disabled and we we're just like perfect advocates and like inclusive experts from day one. Yeah. It's like we used all the shit language for a really long time <laughs> and we tried to cling to ability and like cures and all that kind of crap for so long because it was like one that's what society had like told us to do essentially. But two is just like, that was the real experience. And I like that you share that real experience because I think it also provides space for non-disabled people to be like, ah, like he's grown. Obviously you've gone through the actual lived experience and grown with that. But I think it also shows non-disabled people that they can then learn from that and grow themselves too. Anyway, I think social media is a super powerful tool for disabled people right now, but I didn't know if you wanted to just give your own kind of perspective on it because it is a bit of I guess an important part of your life yeah yeah I I I totally agree with you um I think that the uh kind of disability justice or disability equality movement um has some really interesting dynamics to it that just aren't a part of any other marginalized group right we um being able to physically gather to protest is a privilege and it's a privilege that a lot of uh, disabled people don't have because we can't take it to the streets in the same way. Now people have in the past, right. And we've, we've heard about like amazing people who at the beginning of kind of the civil rights journey for disability did take it to the streets and did some incredible things. But generally speaking, some like half of us are dealing with, um much fewer resources both both financially but then also energy resources it takes energy to get out of the house and to go and and then if you're going to go somewhere to fight for your rights you have to have transportation and transportation is so uh i mean in in new york you know 20 percent of the subways are uh, accessible and the other 80 percent are not so the reason i say all of that is because fighting for one's civil rights has historically been this like physical time space experience. And that's a huge privilege we don't talk about. And disabled people have had to find a way to creatively fight for their rights with half the resources without any of the access and all of those barriers, right? So social media is so wonderful because for many of us, it's far more accessible than the physical world. Social media still is not totally accessible in a lot of ways. Um, And it's important to acknowledge that, but it is so much more um, inclusive and um, I think accessible for people like us to be able to get together and raise our voices and get some visibility that I think is pretty unprecedented. I think actually in just history. So it's why I think that we're, I think that we're gaining some traction and visibility and a voice in a way that I don't know if we've had before. That's exactly, I know from my own experience, I'm through social media, I'm connecting with other people with shared experience of disability that I've never had access to before. So it's kind of giving me that representation that I I crave growing up that we didn't have. Um, I guess, you know, that's kind of for me why representation is so important. I can see what other people are doing, understand that I'm not the only one going through what I'm going through. Um, What is it to you? What does representation mean to you? Uh, I I think my answer is pretty uncreative. It's just like being able to, like, you know, when you think of a representative, you think of someone who appears someone who is visible who stands for people like them right or people who think like them or or whatever there it is that they're representing so for me representation is um really about kind of like validating the human experience when we're talking about it in terms of social justice or marginalization representation is about portraying reality the way things actually are like 
a fifth of the world's population has a disability. And we should see that represented in reality when we look at media or television, right? We want it to actually like represent what's happening in the actual world so that we have the experience of being seen and have the experience that our lives do matter and our stories matter as part of the mosaic of the human story. You, you know, without representation, you just are erasing characters left and right. It's like, you know, it's just, there's your story disappears. Yeah, which then like obviously erases like real people's experience experiences in the real world as well, which is, yeah. yeah, I would like to like talk about like the flow and effect, I guess, of representation as well in the real world of like being hired in a job or <laughs> being offered like the mm-hmm. flexibility that you need to actually perform a job because people have a greater level of understanding or just a greater level of inclusion and compassion or sympathy or empathy or whatever they need to have in order to just be a better person and be more mm-hmm. inclusive. So I love that. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want the people watching along uh, or listening along to this episode to know about you or about your thoughts on representation, inclusion? No, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Um... I think I just want to invite any listener to um, get an education on what disability is and isn't from disabled people Um, and start to get an education in anti-ableism work um, because I really deeply believe that ableism is um, this insidious force that Um, is so woven into the fabric of economy and the human, I mean, obviously the human body, but it affects all of us, our standard of work, of um, what it means to be like a valuable human being is so much attached to what kind of body you have. And if that body can work eight hours a day, you know, five days a week, 40 hours a week, whatever, so you can make money, right? Just, it all comes back to like worth, and function and um i think we all win when we can kind of start to separate those things or at least become aware of them like how does ableism affect all of us abled and disabled alike and of course disabled much much more but it's like that like really simple like this is probably like the most simple like explanation or example i can give of that which is like how ramps don't just like provide accessible like or accessibility to people who are wheelchair users like it's like people who use prams are going to appreciate ramps great Mm. like that Mm. is just probably like the most simple smallest way to give an example of what you're talking about i think so yeah yeah. it's like it it will just benefit everyone and like in terms of economy and stuff we've spoken about um with past guests about like the impact that can have on the economy as well and on welfare and Mm. the demand on welfare and things like that when we actually create truly inclusive societies which will take a while but let's like you said all start engaging in that anti-ableism work so that we can actually start making some proper goals sticking to them and getting towards that end goal anyway rant over let's also now just give people the opportunity (laughs) yeah Give people the opportunity to follow along with you, Carson, if they don't already. Um, where would you like people to go if they want to engage with the work that you do, with um, the life coaching stuff that you do, and whether you want them to go and follow you on Instagram, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. You can find me on yeah, on Instagram. My name is Carson underscore Tuller, like my name. And uh, my website is carsontuller.com. And that's where you'll find all of the other work that I do in terms of speaking engagements or personal and professional development coaching, all that kind of stuff. That's where you can find me. In your Instagram bio, you said that Professor X is your idol. Please explain. <laughs> like I have a little <laughs> Professor X bobblehead on my desk right here. Um, Stop. Uh... I know, I know a client gave him to me. Um, so I, I sometimes think about going back into my profile and like changing that. Um, I do think that X Men does a pretty good job um, at portraying Professor X 
in a not in spell porn way. There are some exceptions to that for sure, especially in some of the most recent films. Um, but I've been pretty pleased with it. I especially related to him because there were a because he is ostensibly like a bridge builder, right? And he's like trying to do what he thinks is like the best thing for mutants and humans to coexist. Um, and I just didn't see a lot of like cartoons or characters that used wheelchairs, much less that were like paralyzed who also didn't want to like end their lives. Well, now I think it's time for us to jump into reviewing A Quiet Place Part 2. Steph, can you just give us the uh, obligatory little intro? So A Quiet Place Part 2, we return to the world of the Abbott family. Um, Spoiler alerts, at the end of the first film, we sadly lose John Krasinski's character, the father, and we are now dealing with the world without him. There is a bit of a throwback at the beginning that we see sort of the world before these monsters arrived. Um, And then we come back to the present day where this family is needing to get to this place that they think will be safe from these monsters. So they head out on this journey and it's, of course, um, dealing with a world where these monsters um, react to sound. So the family... Not only do they have um, the daughter who is deaf and communicates with ASL, um, but obviously because the monsters respond to sound, that is how they have to communicate in order to stay safe as well. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting the way they've incorporated this, like, um, disability kind of narrative into this post-apocalyptic thriller kind of I don't know it it really works well like I'm not one for you know usually when disability is in like a horror thriller kind of thing it's not it doesn't necessarily go down well as representation but somehow it's usually the bad guy (laughs) yeah Yeah. somehow or you know like the the disability is scary or something like that whereas this look I I'm quite a fan but Carson maybe you can kick us off first What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, okay. I came with my most discerning, uh, you know, like intention to really pick this apart. I have to say uh, it holds up pretty well. It holds up pretty well. I do have some critiques. I have some some feelings about it. But um, in terms of like things that really work, I think there's a good amount um, that works first they hired a disabled actor right so reagan yeah. is played by millie simmons and i did a little i wanted to make sure that i had all the names right so millie is deaf right the impact of that alone um it just makes a massive difference in the accuracy of the film right in the way that it's actually portrayed because you've got an individual with a life experience who um, is also acting in many ways as a kind of like a consultant throughout the film. Um, But then there are also, you know, I'm just thinking about the kind of the practical implications of having a disabled actor. It means things have to be accessible on set. It kind of forces an accessibility behind the scenes and it really creates a culture where this has to be inclusive if you're gonna have disabled actors, right? And so I love that. That is like the first thing that we look for. I'm sure you talk about this all the time, right? And is the actor disabled? And it's so great when they are, right? So that was my first like check. Literally check. the number one win. Yeah. It's like the number one thing I feel like that we look at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, like it just made her character so three-dimensional. Like she wasn't this 2D version of what an able-bodied person thinks um, is the exp- what the experience of a deaf person is. Like, you can tell there's just something innate in, like, we sense it, that it is authentic. It comes across so well. One of my main things, which I think also was in the first film, Quiet 
well, like they did this quite well in the first film as well, was that it wasn't like this massive part of Reagan's life, if that makes sense. Like it's it's not like the whole like, you know, scenes with Reagan don't just become like totally about her deafness ever. Like it's not just always like, oh, there's monsters coming, but Reagan's deaf. Like it's just like, it just is. Like it's just part of her character, which is also like you're saying, like the three-dimensional and the real kind of representation of what it would be as a person who is deaf. And I'm, I love that so much because we so often get those really crappy representations where it's just like like something like me before you for example which we've also reviewed before where like his disability is just like everything all of the time and i'm like that's not always the case like for some people that might be the case for them but you know for the majority of the disabled people i know that's not how their life works so you know i love that you know they had bigger things to worry about right they had aliens to worry about so it was kind of like And I also loved that, like, she could be the hero without being in this, like, inspo porny way. Like, they just navigated that really well to have, like, her disability to be tied in with, you know, her being the hero without it being, like, she's overcome her disability. Like, there wasn't really ever a moment where I thought, oh, they've, like, added in some, like, super special power where she can, like, sense the monsters or something or, like... They didn't do anything gross as well where she was like she felt like she related to the monsters where she, because she was different too like i hate that narrative as well which we spoke about last week as well so yeah i just i actually really loved the way that they actually structured the character and the narrative around the character in this one i think it was interesting that they her disability or you know her her being deaf there was like the the advantages and also the disadvantages showing like you know, the advantage was she was able to communicate in obviously a silent way. They already had that built into their family unit and she was able to sort of use use that to her strength and she was able to use her, her hearing aid to, you know, ward off the monsters, like they found that kind of way. But then it also showed her vulnerability as a character when she didn't have that hearing aid. Like removing that made her more susceptible if she couldn't, hear someone yelling out run or something like that. So for me, that is a very true representation of disability. There are, there absolutely can be disadvantages, but there can be advantages as well. So it's important to show both sides of that spectrum. And it's just about the way you frame it as well. Like, I didn't feel like there was ever a character who like pitied her because she was deaf, which Mm -hmm. was amazing. Like even Emmett, when they were like having in this like second film, there's like moments where there's like communication breakdown almost between yeah. um, Reagan and Emmett when it's just the two of them on their merry journey. Uh, yeah. But there's never any like, like it's almost like Emmett takes responsibility too for the communication breakdown. It's not like yeah. he doesn't get like really frustrated with her and he doesn't also like pity her for being deaf, I don't think. Like it really mm-hmm. is portrayed as a strength, like being able to communicate with ASL. So, which I think in the real world would be too. So. Can I say, it was really nice to see a moment where the effort that has to be made in order to communicate didn't solely fall onto the person that has the disability. At that point um, where she tells him, like, you have to enunciate, you have to, like, I can't, you know, you have to do, you have to put some of the effort in. That was really nice to sort of show an able-bodied audience that actually you can meet us in the middle. Like, we don't have to always be the ones accommodating to fit into your world you can actually make some accommodations to let us fit into your world i thought that was a really nice moment it's a really important moment. yeah yeah I, um i really liked as well sorry i'm just like on this steam no, no. <laughs> i liked no, as well no. like um when they were doing those flashbacks there was a moment it just ties into that whole like you know how reagan brought like a new strength into their family, I guess, but not in like an inspo porny way, because that kind of sounded inspo porny. Um, like when they did the flashback, there was a part where the brother, I've forgotten his name, was like playing baseball. And then from afar, the mum's actually able to communicate to him and like help him feel a bit more calm through ASL. And I really liked that as well. It's just like these moments that are just like throughout that for some people, they'd be like over the top of their heads. But I think, you know, when 
you're a person with disability, you don't see those types of representations very often. You're like, this is amazing. Like it's just, just so seamlessly throughout, but yeah, loved that. Yeah. I think we can talk about Carson. I think you had some critiques. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear your critiques. <laughs> oh, well, there, there are a few, but, um, the only thing I thought was that occasionally, well, let me think about this. So at the end of the day, her disability is, it's not a superpower, right? But it is like a key to winning the game, right? And so the only thing that I ever, I mean, I'm just like flagging it. I don't even know if it actually falls into the uh, (laughs) problematic category, but I thought, okay, you know, sometimes people or, or uh, the media will demonstrate a disability as being a superpower because it almost justifies the presence of the disability, right? So like it compensates for it so that it's like a strength and not a weakness, right? But it's like, oh, look, this particular, um, you know, attribute actually is what saved the day. And I think sometimes that points to compensating for something does that make sense it would also be nice to just have a horror film that's similar to this where there's someone who's deaf or disabled and like it's not doesn't make them the hero like they just are the character they might die three quarters of the way through i don't care but like they just are a disabled character going through the narrative yeah i thought okay what if reagan the you know the deaf character had solved the issue or had you know uh found a way to like beat the aliens that had nothing to do with her being disabled right and it was just like her sheer skill or wit or courage or something like that i think we do see all of those things i actually think she's a pretty complex character in terms of she's like a broody teenager sometimes and she's also a little bit um you know, risk-taking or maybe a little rash and maybe a little frustrated with her parents, right? So we see like all of these other complex things that have us like her um, or even maybe judge her, right? As like a broody little teenager. But I think that's why she comes across not as like inspiration porn because we get to see, okay, this is really about her. It's not really about the disability. But I thought, you know, it would be like even more anti-ableist to like have her just kick ass because she is of herself a kick-ass human being right yeah yeah Yeah. so that was one thing that i was yeah i get what you mean and it's almost like you know if the cochlear implant and the like distortion noise is wasn't the only thing that killed the monsters would they have even included a deaf character in it and then we would have had no yes. disability representation. It's almost like I get where you're going with it. Like, it's like, Just it's not like right? the end product of probably what we're looking for. It's like yeah. really good, but it's like possibly like a stepping stone towards what we would be like, hell yeah, this is an awesome inclusive movie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a, it's a plot tool. It's, it would be like yeah. if I was in a movie and my wheelchair was the thing that won the day, you know, like saved the day, but it wasn't me. Like, I I think that's so true. It's a good point to make, like people with disabilities who use mobility aids or accessibility aids, whatever you want to call them, like we're we're people, we're more than the aids that we use in our lives. We're more than the wheelchair hearing aids. Uh, We need to be seen as people first. So yes, I I agree. It would have been not like, it it was an easy plot tool to use, yeah. Yeah, and because they've done like such an amazing job as well, like, I didn't even really think about it as a plot tool, which is like probably why I'm like, this is still a very good film. But when you look at it, it actually is like disability still is a bit of a plot tool in this. Oh yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I guess like the other thing, the only other critique that I had of the film was, and this is literally of every film, I know we've spoken about it before, is more incidental disability. Like I, I, I could be wrong, I may have missed it, but, you know, in all of the, even like looking back, the flashback scene, I don't believe we saw anyone in a wheelchair necessarily or Mm. any other sort of visible disabilities out 
in the community, which mm. I'm assuming there probably would have been if that was reflective of society, but it just would have been nice just to throw some other stuff in there just to make it a more well-rounded, you know, uh, experience, I guess, of disability. But that's yeah. a very cool critique that I think is of every film pretty much ever made. Um, but, but we'd it's, like to see more. It's a small critique, but it's like, like it might be a small critique, but it's like a very important factor because it's like almost that subliminal messaging. Because if there were like a couple more disabled people and maybe they yeah. are physically disabled to like really represent that in those flashback scenes and like it might just be like a dude in a wheelchair, like pick me, it'll be a dude in a wheelchair and I'll just like flying all over the place because this alien's like totally fucked me up. But like that helps to be like oh okay <laughs> like that helps but the subliminal messaging behind that is that like there are disabled people in society like and there's not just one in the one town and i mean like probably i wouldn't have survived because i don't think i could have been that silent so maybe not in like the post-apocalyptic part but like during the actual flashback scenes, I think they definitely could have been more inclusive. I don't know about you, Carson. Carson's <laughs> laughing at me a lot, but there's no <laughs> fucking way in my wheelchair that I'm oh, yeah, like, no, I am laughing so I able to survive. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. I, I mean, like, I, I think that I, if I did survive, it's because like I don't move at night, right? <laughs> like I could like sleep like a corpse because I don't move or <laughs> like rustle around at night but oh yeah the minute it was like time to get a drink or like move my wheelchair would have just absolutely out of me it would have been a goner yeah so it's just hilarious to like Actually, that, right i love that, that is, out of me that is something that we were talking about before that is has nothing to do with disability but what if you yes. like talk to sleep what if you snore like aren't you gonna wake the monsters how do you control what you do in your sleep yeah. And I was like, how do they go to the toilet, like, so sad? I reckon you could work around that, but I don't know. I mean, these are questions. John Krasinski, could you, like, fill us in? That would be great. I, I want to yeah. know. <laughs> we'll ask yeah. him and just be like, we've got questions. Yeah. <laughs> like, Jesus. Just curious. I'm just curious. curious. Part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love how we've gone down the toilet from around now. That's great. Yes. I love it. Literally. <laughs> we've gotten to that point. Did you have any other critiques? Yeah, yeah. Uh, other critiques? Not, I mean, really not, not too, I yeah. think that was really the only one. No, I'm glad you raised that because like, I didn't even really think about it that way. Cause I think they had done such a good job of building out the character and making them yeah. like so three, three dimensional and like the representation was good. I actually didn't even think about the fact that it's like without this whole plot device which we've even actually included a disabled person that, at all. Yeah. yeah 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 because because that's why I use the word justification right it's like uh, is this what justifies the presence of a disabled person is that they have some contribution that is quote unquote special or unique that makes sense to have them in the film and it kind of goes back to what stephanie was saying around like incidental presence of disabled people. And what I mean is I kind of think disabled people are always seen as just these like, just narratives or stories, like who we are is like a story. And I think that that's reflected in the fact that people come up to us and they always say, what happened to you? Or why are you like this? There's always some justification or explanation for your existence, right? And so I think it would probably be slightly distracting to see some people chilling in wheelchairs and you know because we think of or like as some kind of visible device because I think people think oh what happened it's a distraction it's like um there's always some kind of a story rather than just a human being who gets around in this body I will say though like on the back of this and this is probably like also something that I really like about the two films is that they never really divulge like why like they don't actually divulge like what happened to Regan which is really good um but again I think that's why I also didn't pick up that it is a bit of like a plot device still like it's very interesting how they've like done almost like 95% of it all like so amazingly um which is obviously really good and should be like celebrated on this podcast 
So I think it's time to give our scores out of five on the inclusive disability representation scale for A Quiet Place Part 2. Steph, I'll get you to kick us off. What was your score? I mean, I think my thoughts of the character and the film have been pretty glowing, have been pretty well well taken. Um, I'm going to say 4.5 out of 5. Um, I Yeah, it takes a lot for me to give it a 5. So... Um, yeah just really i love the complexity of the character i love that she doesn't have like a superpower in herself i know we've talked about like the listening aid being like a plot twist like a plot tool but it's also not doing anything extraordinary it's not like she found like this secret setting that she's never noticed before it's like it malfunctioned which happens so um yeah like all of that stuff, 4.5 out of 5 for me. Love it. Carson? Okay, so I think in the context, uh, I'm trying to do two scores. My official score is also a 4.5, although I do want to give like credit for the fact that I think that in the context of today's dis- like films and representation of disabled people, it is like really really high up there it is like a five ish but in the grand scheme of like the representation where we just have nothing to say i'd say a (laughs) 4.5 can i just say i love when we have a guest on steph and it's like when i ask them for their scores it's like they're like they're gonna get in trouble (laughs) it's like the hardest decision and i feel like the first couple of apps i was the same but now i'm like it's chill. I can say a 4.5. And I'm exactly the same. It's a 4.5. And I love that I introduced the 0.5s into the score system. <laughs> Everybody's going for them now. Um, I came in with a 4.5 as well. Um, so probably more like a 4.75. But it was only because I wanted more incidental representation of disability. But now I really am glad that you brought up Carson. Like this is the whole point of this. We're all learning here together that you yeah. have raised that it is actually a, a plot device throughout the film. Uh, the films both of them and yeah i think that's important to highlight as well so it's a very solid 4.5 for me i think um so that's our scores yay that is it for this week's episode and i'm so grateful that the two of you joined me this week i um have loved our conversations i loved our scores and the reasons behind them i love that i learned something again from our guest i think that's awesome and i hope everyone who followed along uh who listened watched whatever you did with this episode also learned something from one of us especially carson um your insights were amazing thank you um and yes definitely go give carson a follow um and jump on our social media as well if you literally just search reframe podcast we are on instagram twitter and facebook and we want you to comment on our posts or flick us some dms let us know what you thought about a quiet place too let us know your um inclusive disability representation scores and literally just any other thoughts or tidbits that you had um especially like if you have um the experience of hard of hearing or you're a deaf person like i'd really like to hear what you thought about this representation um because obviously we don't represent that in this episode and i think it's important to get um that perspective from people with the correct lived experience other than that i also just want to say a really quick thank you to the community broadcasting foundation for funding this podcast um, and podcast series without them we wouldn't be able to have these amazing conversations um, and obviously they're really important to affect change and change attitudes towards people with disability so we're very grateful So thank you again, everyone, and we will see you again next week. Bye.